service. Today we're in 2 Samuel chapter 11. We'll begin by looking at verse 1, and uh, I'll lay a context for you, a little bit, little bit of a background, and then we'll get into our study. But I chose to entitle this particular installment of our, of our study through 2 Samuel um, simply by asking the question, was it worth it? Because as we look at this particular chapter, that's really what came to mind for me as I look at what we see take place here as it is given to us in Scripture. So let's begin reading here in 2 Samuel chapter 11 at verse 1. I'll read verse 1 and we'll get into our study. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Up until this portion of scripture, as we've been looking at King David, we've been seeing him as being quite a man. He fought Goliath, uh, had a great relationship, friendship with uh, a young man named, by the name of Jonathan, a warrior, a courageous leader. Everything about him has been really excellent. What we find here, though, in chapter 11 is really something that, that reveals something about David. It, it, it reveals that David had uh, a flesh. He was a man of flesh also. And so what we have in Scripture is that God will give to us the victories of uh, those whom we refer to as Bible heroes, but he also reveals to us their failures. And what we have here is we have an opportunity in chapter 11 to see failure in the life of King David. Now the things that we find in Scripture are written for us in order that we might grow by reading them and, and learn through their example. In uh, Romans 15, verse 4, it says, uh, Whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. And so whatever things were written were written for our learning. And, and when Paul was writing in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, he, he said to us that Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so God's word is intended to bring reproof and correction. And so there are times when we'll see these great men of God, women of God, but they also have their failures outlined for us in order that we might be instructed by these things. And what we have here in this chapter is an account of one of David's greatest seasons of failure. What it does is it exposes us to the weakness of his flesh and it also enlightens us as to how far a person is willing to fall. It reveals to us an abuse of power and also it shows us what happens when we don't have any accountability. Because David abused his power, he's the king, but he didn't have an accountability, anybody that would hold his feet to the fire, if you will, and, and we see what takes place here. We also see how deep sin really is and how seductive sin can be. That's why the writer of Hebrews in chapter 3, verse 13 says, exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Exhort one another. Have a, a family life. Have a, what the church would call a body life. We being the body of Christ. Having a life amongst ourselves. Because see, it's easy for us to come to church, a church like this, and get lost in a crowd and have nobody who knows really what's going on in your life. And so you can come to church and you can be seated and you can listen to the message, nod your head in agreement on occasion, whatever you do. And you can leave and you can be exactly the same person when you leave as, as you were when you came into the room because you're not taking this to heart. And secondly, you don't have anybody asking you, how are you doing today? No accountability. Nobody who's willing to, to say to you, I, I noticed that you haven't been uh, talking like you used to talk. I noticed that you're not walking like you used to walk. What's up? And, and a lot of us don't have friends like that who are able to and willing to and love us enough to, to confront that. And it's because we have no accountability. That's one of the reasons why it's good to be in a small group. That's why it's good to serve. Because there's accountability. You have people who get to know you beyond that smile that you can bring into church on a Sunday, you see. David was a king. David had power. David was rich. David had everything going for him that, that a man would want. He was in the prime of his life. He had consolidated the kingdom by subduing his enemies. He had married many wives. He had many children. He was at the place of success that few have ever achieved. 
But what we have here is that we have a chapter that reveals to us how David responded to the blessings of God. This chapter actually records two terrible sins David committed. He committed the sin of adultery, and he compounds it with the sin of murder. Most Americans continue to see murder as wrong. Many do not think that adultery really is. Murder? Yeah, that's wrong. Adultery? Well, quite a number of people commit that. I don't think that that's so wrong. I was reading something uh, recently that was uh, taking the uh, recent situation that we find in the press and in the news concerning Tiger Woods. And first it was simply a car accident that he had. And then many have said that that accident was a result of an adulterous affair that he was caught in. And a writer by the name of Angela Kay's Burden wrote concerning that. And this is what she wrote. She wrote, tabloids have pounced on Tiger Woods for his apparent failure to uphold family values. Their stories use traditional morals to define adultery as scandal and include words like sin and confession. At the same time, the purveyors of our pop culture often portray marriage itself as an ar arcane institution that our progressive society should move beyond. In recent years, television shows and Hollywood movies have promoted our acceptance of and even our appetite for infidelity. Major networks are complicit in helping to erode the significance of lifelong commitments and loving relationships between husbands and wives. The same adulterous affair that in real life becomes a threat to reputation, career, and endorsements produces laughs and envy on prime time. Sex is sold as a need-based commodity rather than an expression of shared, committed intimacy. As a phenomena of 24-hour news and reality television have blurred the lines between reality and entertainment, it becomes difficult for us to even know how to respond to a real-life situation of adultery, as evidenced by David Letterman's recent announcement of his affairs in front of a live audience. No matter what it does for television ratings, the fact is that any adultery is hurtful, whether you are young or old, rich or poor. Instead of reverting to voyeurism, we have an opportunity, an obligation, to examine the integrity of our own relationships. Instead of more news anchors covering adulterous scandals, we need more anchors of grace and kindness in our lives. We need a consistent and tender respect for marriage, knowing that faithfulness and commitment are dying virtues in what could otherwise be defined as an age of individualism and instant gratification. We need to reject Hollywood's lie that the thrill of fresh attraction is more desirable than the thrill that comes from a lifetime of living together and finishing each other's sentences. We might even choose to turn off the television and soberly reflect on our own relationships and what actions we might take to cultivate intimacy with the one we're with in order to safeguard against the same marital temptations that, if not today, might tomorrow be ours. What we're looking at here is an adulterous affair that King David had that ended up in murder. And the question has to be asked to David, was it worth it? Was it worth it? Now, as we look at this passage, we begin with verse 1. And with verse 1, it simply says, It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. And so what you have here is you have a continuation of what we were seeing in chapter 10. In, in chapter 10, Joab had defeated the army of the Syrians, and, and they fled before him. Now, there was another army, the army of the Ammonites, and they saw what happened to the Syrians, and they fled from before the brother of Joab, a man by the name of Abishai. So while the Ammonites retreated, Joab went back to Jerusalem, but the Syrians regrouped. We saw how that David heard that the Syrians were reinforced, preparing for battle. He came against them, defeated their armies, and the result was that the Syrians began to fear helping the Ammonites. You see, as we get into chapter 11 in verse 1, the Ammonites were yet to be dealt with. The time has come to do so. Now it tells us what had happened, why it was delayed. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle. Normally warfare would be conducted when, when the weather permitted. And so in the Middle East, the heat can be incredible. Or the winters can be very bad. And so what they would do is they would have seasons of warfare. 
You see that even to, to recent history in, in World War II when, when Germany invaded Russia, it's been said that the weather was just as great a foe as the Russian army. And a lot of the Germans died to the weather as they did to the military strength of the Russians. Even today when you go into the Middle East, it can be up to 120 degrees. And so it's very difficult to conduct warfare in those conditions. And so they would wait until the season permitted and that's what's happening here. So it happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. So they went out to war. And as they did so, they, they um, began to destroy the Ammonites and laid siege to their capital city, a place called Rabbah. Now as that's taking place, David remains in Jerusalem. Notice how it says there in verse 11 that he, he remained at Jerusalem. David didn't go out, in other words, accompanying his, his troops. Now David is there in the, the comfort of his prosperity. He had a, a custom home. And there's no doubt that he enjoyed the, the beauty of the city there of Jerusalem. And so because he felt that business with Ammon could be handled by his, his general Joab, he decides to take some time off. And so one of the things we learn that can lead to, to adultery, can lead to great sin, one of the things that I learned immediately is how that the writer makes a point of telling us David remained at Jerusalem, but this was the season when kings went out to war. And so what you have is you have a time of peace and prosperity, at least in the life of David, to the degree that he is willing to release his general to go and fight a battle that he normally would be part of sends him out to fight and in doing so as he's there just languishing in his, in his peace and prosperity in a beautiful, beautiful house in a, a wonderful city, it's when he falls. And so one of the things we learn is times of prosperity can be more difficult than times of adversity. When you're going through hard times, isn't it true you're on your face more often praying and asking God for help? When you're going through hard times, isn't it true that we say, God, you've got to deliver me and my mind is only on this obstacle I've got before me and I find myself reading more and praying more and asking for more, more advice. But man, when I'm going through times of a great season of prosperity in my life, everything's going well, I can neglect those things. The Bible makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And so what we see taking place here is one, is that David is there in Jerusalem in a time he should be leading his soldiers. Now as this is taking place, verses 2 through 4 read, it happened one evening that David arose from his bed, walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. She wasn't just beautiful, she was very beautiful. So David sent and inquired about the woman. Someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. For she was cleansed from her impurity and she returned to her house. And so as this is all taking place, it happens one evening that David arises from his bed. In other words, he had taken an afternoon nap. It was warm. It's now cool in the evening. He decides to go outside. And as is true even to this day, they had a flat roof that you could actually walk on. And, and people would spend time on the roof because it was cooler there in the, in the uh, evening after a, a warm day. And that's what David's doing. And as he's walking, and it, and it says here that David walked. Uh, he walked on the roof. That word walk can also mean he paced. It could be speaking of him having energy. He's there, just kind of got something on his mind. It's possible that he's thinking about his situation or what's taking place. He's got some concerns. But as he does so, he happens to look down. Now, the king's house was built on the top of the hill, and all the other homes would be built below him. And so because he's king, he's on the top of the hill, he can look down the hill. And as he does so, he's distracted for a moment there. Temptation comes upon him unexpectedly. He sees a woman by the name of Bathsheba as she is bathing. So a second thing we see is temptation doesn't notify us as to when it's going to appear. It doesn't send me a letter saying, oh, by the way, you need to be aware that next Tuesday at 5 o'clock, you're going to be tempted. I've never gotten a letter like that. It just comes. It comes on you, and that's what happens here with David. David's out there walking in the cool of the evening, distracted by concerns more than likely, and he just happens to look down. As he looks down, he can see into one of his neighbor's yards. And as he sees into the neighbor's yard, he can see behind an enclosure that there's a beautiful woman there, and she's bathing. Now, as he sees her bathing, it's more than likely that she is ritually cleansing herself or purifying herself. When you study the Old Testament book of Leviticus in chapter 15, that chapter speaks concerning ritual cleansings that take place after certain events in a woman's life. 
And so it would seem that what she's doing is she's taking a purification bath because she's cleansing herself after her menstrual cycle. You'll see this in just a moment. Now she's in an enclosure, but she's visible to David. And so notice what happens. Temptation strikes. But it says here from the roof in verse 2, he saw a woman bathing. That gives us another insight. Men are normally visually stimulated. It doesn't take much for a man to become interested. And as he's there and he's looking down and there's this beautiful woman bathing. He's there, there's Beyonce bathing. <laughs> a man. Now I told my wife, I said, listen, when we got married, I did not go blind. <laughs> there's a difference between a glance and staring and allowing your lust to begin to formulate in you to the point of creating plans which is what David's going through it's one thing if he looks down there and he says whoa you know better get out of here David didn't do that David looked down there and he goes oh showtime <laughs> and when he did that Man, he gave in to his lust. He could have averted his eyes, but he didn't want to. He wanted to look, and he kept looking. And it only takes about 12 seconds for him to start making some plans. Man. Now Job, in chapter 31, verse 1 of his book, says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? Job knew the danger of allowing yourself to get caught staring at that young thing. He knew that. He knew that. You go into the office, you go into the, the, the shop, the store, whatever, and, and, and there's somebody there. And, and, and a lot of times guys don't really think about this kind of thing. They really don't. But you go walking in and, and one of your fellow workers or perhaps one of the people who are manning uh, one of the desks at this place that you're making a delivery or whatever, you know, that person's always, you know, freshly bathed and always their hair is always just right and they've got their makeup on, you know, from a man's perspective to looking at a woman. And you might have left your wife that morning and she was still in bed and everything and she didn't have her makeup on and her hair wasn't all done and she wasn't all smelling of perfume. So, you know, you had done this thing here when she spoke to you, saying, you know, you know <laughs> toothbrush is over there, baby, you know. So you go into that place, and as you go into that place, there's Miss Hot Thing, and, and you look at her, and you go, whoa. And, and, you know, it's one thing to notice. It's another thing to begin to want to be there again and, and looking forward to being there and then want to talk to her and start a conversation. It's another thing, and that's what David's doing here. He's looking at Bathsheba, and as he looks at her, he's, he's watching her, and, he's, and now he's beginning to think, and he's making some plans, and before you know it, you know, after all, I am, I am the king and everything. I can pretty much do what I want. I want to know who she is. And so what does he do? Well, in verse 3, it says that he sent and he inquired. He sent and he inquired of her. And, and someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So he sent and inquired. Now, when he gets the answer, in that answer, there's a warning because she's the daughter of Eliam. Now, Eliam is found in 2 Samuel 23, verse 34. Eliam is listed as one of David's mighty men. Eliam was the son of a man by the name of Ahithophel, who was a counselor of King David, which means that Bathsheba was Ahithophel's granddaughter. Later on in chapter 16 of 2 Samuel, verse 15, you're going to see that Ahithophel backed David's son Absalom in David's son's rebellion against him. And it may be because David had done this with his granddaughter. Now beyond that, he also lets him know she's married. She's married. Notice how he says, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? That's the warning. She's married, hands off, cool down. She's a married woman, David. She is married to one of your mighty men. Uriah the Hittite was a convert to the Jewish faith and had found himself in the army of David and was a warrior above warriors. He was one of the mighty men of King David, a loyal soldier to the end. And what you have here is you have a warning. It's a discreet warning. Cool off, back down. You already have wives. You already have concubines. 
We've already seen that David has a variety of wives. Many wives. Michal, Ahinoam, Abigail, Maacha, Haggith, Abital, Eglah. He had wives and concubines we find in chapters, chapter 3 and chapter 5. David, if you have some passion, if you have a desire, there's a proper place for you to find your desire met. And that's in your marriage. That's with your wife. The Bible tells us in, in Proverbs chapter 5, verse 15, drink water from your own cistern, running water from your own well. You have a wife, enjoy her. David, you have several wives, concubines. It's just a moment of passion. If it's just that, satisfy your passion in a legitimate fashion. But, but don't go out there and take one of your men's wives. She doesn't belong to you, David. It's a warning. Because if you take her, you will commit adultery. She's married to another man. She is not free to be with you. Now David knew the law. In the Old Testament book of Leviticus, chapter 20, verse 10, it says, the man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. This is a capital offense, David. In Exodus chapter 20, the Bible makes it clear, thou shalt not commit adultery. You're not to covet another man's wife. David, you have what you already have. You've been blessed by God tremendously. Beautiful wives, lots of children. Satisfy yourself with your own well, but don't do this thing. That's what you find couched in the answer. Well, did he listen? No, because in verse 5, King David sent and brought him out of the house, or rather, King David sent and took her, and he lay with her, verse 4. She came to him, he lay with her, she was cleansed from her impurity. She returned to her house. Did David listen? No. Man, this guy, it was all systems go. There's nothing going to stop this from happening. This is it. These guys get this, this, this lust in their eyes, and that's all there is to it. I am going to have her. I don't care what you say. I don't care who it hurts. I don't care what happens. I have to have her, and I want to have her now. And there's nothing you can say to stop me. I want her. That's where David was. He's not used to hearing the word no. He's the king. Handsome, rich, loved by all of Israel. Loyal men, tremendous army, warrior upon, uh, over all warriors. This is a tremendous man, the kind of man who when he would see a girl like Bathsheba and she would look at him, she would want to be with him too. She was the kind of man, he, he was the kind of man that she would want to be with and she was the kind of woman that David wanted right now. And so he says, I want her. Now, as his subject, she would be obligated to come to the king when commanded. If somebody comes and says to her, the king is calling you, she needed to come. But she didn't need to sleep with him. All she needed to do is to say, I am Uriah's wife. It is not lawful for me to have relationships with you. She could have said that, but she didn't. So she was complicit in what happened. But power is extremely attractive to some people. And she was attracted to it. Now, what's interesting, and you need to see this, it says here in verse 4, she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house verse 5 and the woman conceived now the reason it says that to us makes it clear is because they want you to know that she had been cleansed because she had recently had her menstrual cycle which means that she was not pregnant when she lay with David it's one of those ways of pointing out that she became pregnant through this relationship she wasn't pregnant before she became pregnant so she conceived and she sent and told David and said busted I'm with child. So what does David do? He does what people are inclined to do. He tries to cover it up. He doesn't want, he doesn't want any problems with this. So, verse 6, David sent to Joab saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war prospered. In other words, he made small talk. And David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. 
So Uriah departed from the king's house, and a gift of food from the king followed him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. So David just brings him in and pretends to make small talk, when in reality, as we can see very clearly, all he really wanted to do was get this man to go home and be with his wife so that should he lie with her and then she becomes pregnant, Uriah's going to think, that's my child. And so naturally, that's what David's trying to do. He's trying to get him to go and sleep with her. Now, he's an honorable man. And what he does is he sleeps as a, as a king's servant at the door of David's house. David didn't count on that. He didn't expect this. But God's not going to let David get away with it. You see, when it says here, uh, go in verse 8, go down to your house and wash your feet, that's, uh, that's a, a euphemism for, for go home and, and go to bed with your wife. Because during that day, they would walk with their sandals. Their feet would get dirty. Before they went to bed, they would wash their feet. So what David is saying to Uriah is, go and, and have an enjoyable evening with your wife. He's trying to encourage him to go to bed with Bathsheba, but he was not really aware of the fact that Uriah had such integrity and honor and wouldn't do it. So he stays there in the guardhouse in full view of all of these witnesses who will say he never left. He stayed there and spent the night. Well, as that's taking place, verse 10, so when they told David, saying Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, uh, did you not come from a journey? Why did you not go down to your house? And Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents and my Lord, Joab, and the servants of my Lord are encamped in, a, in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I, I will not do this thing. Why didn't you go home and sleep with your wife? Well, because it's not proper for me to do so. It's not proper for me to have that kind of relationship right now. Now, what is, what is interesting, I mentioned this to you, is that Uriah was a convert to the religion of Israel and as a convert was very careful to obey the word of God. And he knew that were he to go home and sleep with his wife, according to the law, he could not rejoin the troop. He had to stay out because he'd be unclean. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy 23 verse 10, it says, If there is among you any man who is unclean because of a nocturnal emission, he must go outside the camp. He may not re-enter the camp. And so he said, there's no way I can do that. I cannot have physical relations with my wife because it means that I cannot rejoin the troops. This is a man of integrity. And so therefore, I will not do this thing. Verse 12, David said to Uriah, wait here today also and tomorrow I'll let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now, when David called him, he ate and drank before him and he made him drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. David's thinking, if I can get him a little drunk, he's going to want to go home to mama. That's the way David thought. And so he's banking on this guy to get a little high, to forget about restrictions and all. This is a great sin on the part of David. He's lying to him. He's now making him drunk. He's doing all kinds of things to manipulate this man just to try and cover up his own sin. But every time, Uriah just does not go along with him. And so finally, verse 14, in the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So it was while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab. And some of the people of the servants of David fell. And Uriah the Hittite died also. Uriah's unswerving loyalty to David led him to deliver his own death warrant. He took a letter to Joab. Joab reads it. David says, put him in the hottest part of the battle. Withdraw yourself. Let him die. His own death warrant was delivered by Uriah. So David now adds to the sin of adultery, the sin of murder. Let him die in battle. Uriah is one of these men who was, you know, for God, king, and country. And he was out there 
fighting valiantly as David's mighty man with great loyalty to David, and he ends up getting killed. What an incredible betrayal of someone's love and trust. Well, in verse 18, Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war and charged the messenger, saying, When you finish telling the matters of the war to the king, if it happens that the king's wrath rises, and he says to you, Why did you approach so near to the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck Abimelech, the son of Jerubasheth? Was it not a woman who cast a piece of millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go near the wall? Then you shall say, Your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent by him. And the messenger said to David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out to us in the field. Then we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate. The archers shot from the wall at your servants, and some of the king's servants are dead. And your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city. Overthrow it. So encourage him. Anticipating David's anger, Joab tells the messenger what to say to David. You see, David was a, a battlefield genius, and normally such military incompetence would have made him very angry. So he tells him, this is how you should say it. Tell him what happened. Good men died alongside of Uriah, but Uriah is dead. Let him know. Good men died. You know, adultery is not a victimless sin because others pay the price for somebody else's lust. Families are destroyed not to mention the pain that is placed on innocent shoulders. Adultery is one of those sins in our society that people don't even really think about. They, they really don't to any degree as they used to. Even believers don't think it's that big a deal. They don't think it's that big a thing. When I was an assisting pastor in another fellowship, one of the ministries that I had was that I was a chaplain in our softball team. I played a lot of softball and I, and I was a chaplain so I would lead devotions and teach the guys the Word of God as we played in our league. And uh, I already was known, this was in the late 70s, I already was known as a man who loved his wife. They knew that I loved Marie, my wife, and I was, I was known for that even then. And uh, I remember a man who was on our team. Don't remember his name anymore. It's been too long. But I remember a man who was on our team who spoke to me one day after a practice, and he said, you know, you know how much you love Marie? He says, I want you to know I love my wife as deeply as you love yours. And I said, that's good, because that means you must love her an awful lot. He says, I really do. Now, he wasn't one of these guys who talked very often. He was one of these quiet guys. He'd bring his glove and his cleats. He'd play ball and he'd leave. He didn't really ever talk. So for him, that was really kind of unusual that he actually opened his heart to tell me that he loved his wife. His wife began working, and as she was working this particular job, she met somebody on the job, committed adultery. And I got the phone call. I got the phone call that said so and so just received had just received word that his wife committed adultery and they found him dead in his garage he took a rope out and hanged himself committed suicide and i did his funeral and and as i was doing that funeral i was remembering this quiet man who really only that i could recall spoke to me on that one occasion telling me, as much as you love your wife, that's how much I love mine. Adultery is not a victimless sin. Never has been, never will be. It destroys. It destroys people. It destroys homes. It destroys families. It destroys. It's destructive. It destroys societies. It isn't something that, that has a victimless kind of attachment to it. I've said this before many times. 
Man sees a woman, she's so good looking, she makes herself available. It can go either way, by the way, but from a man's perspective, she makes herself available. She knows that he's married, but he's been whining and crying and telling her, oh, my wife doesn't understand me, she doesn't appreciate me. And this woman, for whatever reason, is attracted to this guy, and so she listens to the things he says. His stories are all new to her. His jokes are funny to her. She's attracted to him. She's, he's attracted to her. And, and after a while, they begin to have something going on where well, he walks in and he, he gets this, his heart begins to, to pound in his chest quickly. He's looking forward to seeing her. He walks in. She sees him. They move into having some coffee. Before you know it, they have lunch. Before you know it, they go to a motel. And he thinks it's worth it. He thinks it's great. It's, it's fresh. It's new. It's an adventure. It's, it's fun. And I've shared this with men. I'll share it with the church. When you climb into bed with somebody, the result is always the same. It's always the same. There's nothing unique about the experience you have other than the fact that you think it's fresh at that moment. And what makes sex good in marriage is the love that keeps you together because he doesn't get up in the morning and leave you there by yourself. He comes back that night and the next night and the next night for the rest of his life. That's what makes it unique. Any dog can have a litter. It takes a man to be a father and a husband. And that's what God has called us to be. And we need to understand that. And the woman has no shame. She has a relationship with a married man. She has no shame. And the man has no love for God or his wife, or his babies. Many years ago, many years ago, when I was a young man, and we already had all four of our kids, I was a young man. I've shared this with you before. I had a dream, a dream that I had committed adultery, and in my dream, I looked into the eyes of Marie, and I had to tell my wife, I've been unfaithful. I experienced in that dream the pain that I would go through if I ever had to actually say something like that. Her eyes that at one time was, had been filled with, with, with love and admiration for me as her husband were, were filled with tears and pain. I'll never forget that. Then I had to speak to my kids and I shared with them, your dad has been unfaithful to your mother. I've been with another woman. And I remember the faces of my children as they began to weep and sob and my sons especially began to weep because of what father, their daddy had done. That, that dream was so real. It was so real. I have never forgotten it. I never want to see a look like that in the face of my children. Never want to see the pain in my wife's eye. I never never want to see that kind of thing in the eyes of those who love and respect me. So the guy fails. He's with the girl, ends up leaving his wife. The girl he's with doesn't want him. He ends up by himself. He had children. His daughter gets married. He's fortunate to get an invitation. He comes and he sits in the back of the church. And the wedding procession begins and everybody stands and here comes this beautiful little girl, this bride, as she's walking up the center aisle and her arm is wrapped around the arm of another man. She stops in the front and the minister says, who gives this woman to be married to this man? And that man says, her mother and I do, when the father's in the back of the church thinking that should be me giving my little girl to that young man. Look at what I gave up. Look at what I gave up. I did the wedding for a friend of Actually, I participated in the wedding for a friend of mine, Randy Walls' daughter, Tracy. Randy walked her up, and I did the opening, and then Randy came up and completed the ceremony. And when Randy and Trey came walking up, I asked that question, who gives this woman to be married to this man? Randy says, her mother and I. And then she had a veil, Tracy had a veil. Randy takes that veil and lifts it over his little girl's face, kisses her on the mouth, puts it back down. He says, I have a right to kiss my little girl before he kisses her as her husband. I kissed her goodbye. And I teared up like I am right now. I thought, what a precious moment for a dad 
to kiss his baby goodbye. You're giving it up. You're giving it up. You're giving it up when you break your vows. You're giving it all up for nothing, for nothing. You're breaking hearts and destroying families for what? For nothing. And that's what David did in a society that is so prone to think that sex is the answer, that love is simply having sex with somebody. Or even believers are sleeping with boyfriends and calling them my fiance. That's called fornication, not fiance. But when you get involved like that and you think, oh, God is okay with this, no. I want you to see something here. Verse 26, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. She became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. They thought they got away with it. After all, we got married. Doesn't that make it right? Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Was it worth it? Was it worth it? The answer is no. You sow to the flesh from the flesh, you reap corruption. David, you had it all, man. You're handsome, courageous. Loved by everybody. Wealthy. Beautiful home. Living in a beautiful city. Military strength. Wives, children, concubines. You had it all. How much was enough, David? And the answer? One more. But she wasn't yours, David. She was the wife a wife, and I want you to see that. Notice verse 26, it doesn't say when Bathsheba heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead. It says when the wife of Uriah. To remind us, she didn't belong to David. She belonged to Uriah. She mourns for 30 days or so, gets married, it's okay now, it'll be fine. This thing displeased the Lord. And we're going to see how God acts when he gets displeased when we look at chapter 12.